And I want to read just three verses to serve as a foundation for some thoughts this morning from Ephesians chapter 6, and I want to begin reading at verse 10 through 12. Ephesians 6, verses 10 through 12. And I'm reading from the New King James Version of the Holy Scripture. Finally, my brethren, be strong in the Lord and in the power of his might. Put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. For we wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, against powers, against the rulers of the darkness of this age, against spiritual hosts of wickedness in heavenly places. May God's rich blessing be to his word and may it be sanctified in his heart. Let's bow for prayer, shall we? Father, we thank you for your word, for it's the interest of your word that gives light. And we desire to be illumined, to be enlightened this morning by instruction that only you can give to us as the Holy Spirit takes the things of God and of Christ and make it known to us. And we submit this morning to the Holy Spirit's teaching, to his anointing, and we pray that he might open our eyes that we might see glorious, magnificent, splendors, and glorious truth from your law. We'll be ever so careful to give your name the, all of the honor, all the praise, and all of the glory. For it's in Jesus' name we pray and give thanks. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. I want to speak this morning just for a few moments, not so much an expositional message as just some thoughts from the subject of hand-to-hand -hand combat. Hand-to-hand -hand combat. Uh, this past week, I had the privilege of being with my good friend and my brother, Pastor Lord Allen Hill, for the memorial service of his dear mother, whom had been long time ill, and Pastor Hill and his wife and family had provided care to his mother. And I believe that Pastor Hill delivered one of the most amazing eulogies that I've ever heard as he eulogized his own beloved and dear mother. And I'm going to get a copy of it because I want some of you to watch it or to listen to it. It was extremely powerful, and I particularly would like for some of our young people to hear what he had to say about his mother. But much of what he said stood out to me, but I remember very vividly one line as I've been replaying the sermon over and over in my mind. And he talked about his own life and his own upbringing and how difficult and how hard it was, and he did not realize how bad the situation was for them till he himself became an adult. And he talked about his mother walking out the hollow over there in North Charleston to catch the bus and going down to work at the hospital, then walking back every day and uh, grinding the bus back and then going up the hollow and then cooking and taking care of the family. And he talked about his own life and his own ordeal and the heartache that he brought to his own mother's heart. Now he found himself in a ditch and a lot of people were throwing dirt on top of him and saying, just cover him up. And there his mother was standing over the top of the ditch, extending her helping hand to lift him up out of the pit. And he'll say, in my ministry in this city, I run across people that's in bad shape. As a matter of fact, they're in such bad shape, Hill said, I don't see how they can make it. I don't see how they're making it. And then he said, they, they must have a mama like I have. And that rung in my own heart, my own mind, in the hearts of many there who could have given testimony to the type of mother that we had that st stuck with us as a friend that would not thin out when things that were going got tough, to encourage us, to support us, and to challenge us to continue to persevere and to move forward. And in life, we find ourselves in that type of peril very often. We're trying to find a reason to go on, to persevere, to press forward, to not give in a towel, not throw up our hands in frustration, not say uncle and just say, I'm just going to throw it all up. We try to find a reason to go on. And I believe that God brings us motivation through people. Sometimes it's our mother or our father, sisters or brothers, aunts or uncles, a friend, a relative. 
someone that will come alongside of us and say just enough that needs to be said, perform some deed of kindness toward us to remind us of our value to them as an individual and as a human being. And that's just enough to stoke the fire in our heart, to cause our passion to swell up inside of us that we might continue to fight on in the name of Jesus. I think that's what Paul was trying to do here for the church at Ephesus. We talked the church, about the church at Ephesus before. This very powerful church theologically, uh, doctrinally, even spiritually, and they even had some people of stature and influence within their congregation. But when they looked out at the opposition that they faced in this pagan city called Ephesus, where there was this giant shrine and temple to the goddess Diana or Artemis, and where sexual immorality and filth was the order of the day. They saw themselves, this little small congregation, how in the world could they make a dent in the darkness? How could they dispel into the darkness and despair that existed in this city called Ephesus? They were small in number. But Paul then reminds them of several reasons as to why they can and why they must because of what was at stake. And I think we find ourselves in the same peril in this nation today. I wish that I could have five minutes with Barack Obama, just five. Probably wouldn't take but three. And what I would say to him, I said, Mr. President, you got to fall down your knees, on your knees before God. And you got to find out what it is God wants you to do, and you silence all of the advisors, all of the counselors, the generals, everybody, and do whatever it is that God say that we need to do at this hour, at this time in history. Most Americans don't have a clue as to how perilous we are now positioned in the world order. The last of the great world powers, the United States of America, with enough nuclear armament to destroy the nations multiple times, but we find ourselves held hostage by a bunch of mountain people in a place called Afghanistan. And we don't really know what to do. This is a perilous position for us to be in. It's like General Colin Powell would advise every president that he served under. And he, would, he said it when he served under Bush 1. He said, if you go into a nation and if you break the government, you own it. Once you break it, you own it. It's like going into a, a store of exquisite piece of very fragile ornaments. If you break one, you just bought it. So now we find ourselves in a situation, do we get in or do we get out? Do we send 40,000 plus or do we come up with some way to save face and back ourselves out of this? The problem is that if we withdraw, and this is not a political statement, if we withdraw from Afghanistan at this moment, at this hour, our perception in the rest of the world will be marginalized will be marginalized, greatly, greatly marginalized. This place is known as the death of nations. And every nation that's went into Afghanistan, unable to prevail, have left a weaker nation than when they went in. That's the stakes that's at stake here. This, these are high, this is high stakes. This is high drama. If you ever pray for the president, you better pray for him now. If you ever pray for the Joint Chiefs of Staff, you ought to pray for them now. If you ever pray for the generals on the ground, you ought to pray for them now because the generals have drawn a land in the sand. And they say we need 40,000, so anything less than 40,000 will be saying we didn't get what we needed. This is a dangerous place, a dangerous predicament for this nation to be in. And then you get a group of people around the rest of the world, they put more pressure on this president by giving him the Nobel Peace Prize. Now, what was that all about? What, what was that all about? How did he win the Nobel Peace Prize and he'd been the president for less than a year? That's all about posturing and positioning a political figure in a predicament that they ought to make a decision consistent with the honor that you bestowed upon them. This is not a political statement. This is about survival of this great nation that I love dearly. And that we have members of this church whose sons and daughters have went off to defend. The same thing that Paul was saying to the church at Ephesus that we need to understand today. We wrestle not against flesh and blood, but against principalities, 
and against powers. We wrestle against people that hate us and hate everything about us. And what they hate about us the most, what they hate about us the most is our Judeo-Christian 